perspectives. Um, just like before, if you have any questions, feel free to chime in or um, send a chat in. Either way, I've got that pulled up so I can see that. Um, so if you to unmute yourself and ask questions, whatever you want to do, okay? Um, we will talk for 1040. So we'll do a little bit of lecture. We'll take a break, come back and do some more. I told you we were going to hit the ground running. So no slack off time here. We got too much to learn. Okay. So what I really want to start with, like I said, was just kind of um, the nuts and bolts or just the, you know, kind of the basics of what you need to know to be a good evidence-based clinician who's working with children or adolescents. Um, so, you know, your first readings are really all around these concepts of case conceptualization, working specifically with youth and adolescents, um, because it is different, certainly, than working with adults. Um, it's not that you necessarily, you know, use different therapy per se, but what you do is you have to adjust those evidence-based therapies to fit your clients. Um, so just like I wouldn't do the same kind of therapy with a six and a 16 year old, I wouldn't do the same therapy with a 16 year old and a 26 year old or a 66 year old because they're all at different development stages, have different levels of cognitive abilities. And so it's, it's, it's all about that tailoring of your treatment to a particular population. But all of that tailoring starts with a good case conceptualization. And you know, I know my counseling students have heard me say this before, but this is, this is really your base. And if you don't do good case conceptualization, you don't do good therapy because you don't know why it is you're doing what it is you're doing. Imagine if you go to your physician and they just start throwing drugs at you to try, but they don't understand why they're going to use this drug, right? Some of you may have been to physicians like that before. My guess is you probably didn't like it. Or you say, okay, well, why do you want me to take this medication or do this therapy? And they say things like, oh, uh, I think it'll help. Well, that's not a very damn good reason, right? Like, I want to say, oh, well, you have this specific kind of bacterial infection. This medication is going to help fix that particular thing in this way. It's the same thing for mental health, is we need to be able to have a solid foundation and reason why it is that I'm using the kinds of interventions that I'm using. And if I don't, I probably don't know what it is. And all too frequently out there, um, you see that. And you see people who will do interventions, but not be able to tell you why it is they're doing those interventions, what the purpose of it is, why this intervention is related to this problem that someone's having. And if you can't do that, again, you're not doing good therapy. So that's where we start. And case conceptualization is really that, that very first step in being a good evidence-based practitioner. Because what it does is it allows me to uh, choose what kinds of techniques or interventions are likely to be most effective for this case, and then tailor those techniques to this particular case. So when I do, for example, uh, exposure with response prevention, and I'm working with an eight-year-old who has contamination-based fears, I'm going to have to approach that differently than if I'm working with a 12-year-old who has, um, you know, religious obsessions. I may still use exposure and response prevention, but I'm going to have to tailor exactly how I'm doing it to these different groups. Your case formulation also helps you to uh, understand, you know, how quickly I can move through different interventions, how I'm going to implement these interventions, and then also how am I going to evaluate the progress that I'm or not. So in other words, you know, how do I know that my therapy, my treatment are actually working, they're being effective? 
Uh, and that's generally not just by saying, well, I think it's going well, right? Or, or I hope it would be good. Like, no, like, we need to know how to evaluate. So, you know, the last really important aspect of case formulation is that it provides guidance and flexibility to therapy. Um, we have, at this point, a, a large number of really just wonderful evidence-based manualized treatment programs out there for a huge variety of problems, many of which we'll see throughout the semester based on what you all choose. But each and every one of those is not something that is meant to be sort of dogmatically, rigidly adhered to with no flexibility. Instead, each of those is a guide. In general, here's how you treat this problem using this particular intervention package. But how you actually do that, the kind of boots on the ground intervention, that's tailored thanks to your case formulation. When I, I'll, I'll take a case. So I'm, I'm seeing several children right now who have um, pretty severe Tourette's or tics. And for each one of those, I'm using this general C-BITS protocol. It's Comprehensive Behavioral Intervention for Ticks protocol. But for each one of them, they're different. Right? Um, they're different ages. They have different families and family levels of involvement. Uh, they have different resources available to them. They have different developmental and cognitive abilities. And they have different kinds of ticks. So even though my broad way that I treat ticks is the same for everyone that I see, each time that I see a new individual, I'm formulating their particular case of threats. And that means I'm then formulating how I'm gonna treat this with that person in the group. Um, I've got a case I've been seeing for about two months or so. Um, that's a 11 year old girl who her initial reason they were referred to me uh, was for trichotillomania. That's compulsive hair pulling. So she pulls um, her kind of in order, eyelashes, eyebrows, uh, pubic hair, uh, underarm and arm hair, and then head hair around the kind of the, the edges. Now, I treat trick all the time. We have an effective protocol for treating it. But this girl is a challenging case. She also has um, some medical issues. Um, well, she has what's called cyclic vomiting disorder. Okay. She also has pretty severe anxiety issues. She's also slightly developmentally delayed. So I might have a treatment manual for treating trichotillomania in youth, but I don't have a treatment manual for treating trichotillomania in anxious, developmentally delayed youth with medical problems of this specific kind. And that's where your case formulation comes in. So it allows you to tailor that broad nomothetic intervention into a very ideographic intervention, very highly individualized. So I'm able to say, here's what we need to do for you. Right? Yeah, here's what we do for trick generally, but here's what we do for this particular case of trichotillomania. And that's what case formulation does, is it allows us to do that. Instead of trying to, again, rigidly apply these manuals in a way that's not going to fit. So that's kind of why we need to do case formulation. But what is it? Well, case formulation can really just be thought about as taking the scientific method and applying it to each one of your clients that you see and work with. Because what it is is this kind of ongoing process of developing and then testing hypotheses. So what I'm doing as a clinician is I'm doing what's called a scientist practitioner or a local clinical scientist. Right? 
each individual that I see is really an N of one experiment where I'm developing hypotheses and then I'm testing those hypotheses. Now the hypotheses I develop when I'm seeing my clients are, okay, well, what's the cause of this problem or what triggers this particular kind of behavior? What's maintaining this behavior? Those are the hypotheses I'm making. And then I test those hypotheses through intervention. So I apply the intervention and then see what happens. So it's really a very highly scientific, systematic approach when you're doing good case formulation. If you want to talk about a more kind of touchy feel way to think about this, then case formulation is your patient's story. It's the story of what is going on with your patient, why is it that they're having the problems that they're having, and then how can I effectively help them with those problems. And like I mentioned earlier, it's taking a nomothetic theory, a large-scale general theory, and then crafting an ideographic or a very individualized theory. In general, here's why children have OCD. That's a nomothetic theory. And I would say, but here's why specifically this child has OCD and what's going on around them to help maintain that. And so taking that large scale theory and individualizing it. And that's what case formulation really is all about. And it's a very ongoing process, right? This isn't a one and done. This is something that I'm continuously updating based on the data that I'm gathering in terms of is my intervention working, getting feedback about it, and testing it out more. Now, in terms of having a good formulation, you want to do three specific things. One is to follow what my, uh, my shop teacher my technology education teacher called uh, the KISS rule, which was whenever we were designing something, we needed to keep it simple, stupid, right? Don't make things overly and needlessly complicated. Um, it's very, very easy for a lot of us who are clinicians to fall into that trap. Because think about life. Right? Think about your life. Think about how many people you interact with. Think about all the potential influences on your behavior, your cognitions, and your emotional states. And think about all the time involved there. For the last several decades, all the different things that have influenced who you are and why you are the way you are right now. Now, that's a lot. Right? Like, that's a lot. But do I need to think about all of that in order to have a good case formulation of why this person is experiencing depression, anxiety, uh, of, you know, aggressive behavior, whatever it happens to be? Probably not, right? Like, I probably don't need a 17,000 word novel about their life because they're only three years old. Um, so we don't need to needlessly complicate things. And this is where having a really good, solid theoretical orientation helps you out. Because it helps you see what's useful and what's not useful about formulating the case. So in this class, we're going to be focused really on cognitive and behavioral therapies. We're going to be talking about a cognitive behavioral case formulation model. Um, I know our school sites are doing their BCBA stuff. Um, you're very familiar with kind of the behaviorally oriented model, which this very much is. We're just adding the cognitive aspects onto it and calling them cognitions, not things like, you know, uh, non-verbal uh, hidden behaviors, things like that. Um, those of you coming from the, the MFT side, uh, you've had some courses about different kinds of systematic theories, right? Uh, so looking at, you know, various aspects of, kind of the whole system that's encompassing someone. 
what you'll see is that that makes sense here too, uh, because we very much, when we talk about a cognitive behavioral model, we think about not just what's going on inside someone, but the system that they're embedded in, the environment that they're embedded in, and how that impacts behavior as well. So we're going to be focused, you know, using the language of a cognitive behavioral or a CBT theory. Uh, but I think all of you will be able to, to really understand, oh yeah, yeah, this makes sense. So, but we don't even need this accomplishment. I don't need to know exactly what your fifth grade teacher said to you that one day that then made you feel a little upset, which led you to get bullied on the playground when you're 32, right? Like, I don't, I don't need that. Right? Um, and you'll see kind of what those important parts are as we go. You also need to make sure that you keep an open mind. Um, it is incredibly easy for all of us to quickly come to a decision or an idea about uh, why I think a particular thing is the most important thing to focus on, and here's the right thing, and then ignore other information. But a good therapist keeps an open mind. They say, yeah, I think this is what's happening. I think this is what's going on, but they're ready and looking for alternative explanations. Are there other ways to think about this? Is there a reason I could be wrong here? And that sort of thing is incredibly important because if you put those blinders on and you're not allowing yourself to see other options, then you're gonna just keep doing the same thing over and over again and not respond to feedback. So maybe your intervention is not working well. Okay, that means that my hypothesis that means I need to reformulate my hypothesis, discard this old one. And that's a very important aspect. But you also need to make sure that you keep it scientific. And by keeping it scientific, I mean, when you are doing your good formulation work, you're making specific testable hypotheses. I think that if we apply this intervention for this length of time, we'll see this change in this behavior, cognition, emotion, whatever it is we're targeting. So I can test that by applying this intervention. I did that, oof, it didn't work. We need to get rid of that. I need to rethink my hypothesis. So all of these fit together. Right? We're making testable hypotheses. We're keeping an open mind to, I could be wrong. And we're keeping things kind of as simple as possible as we go. So, questions, thoughts, response right now. I've just been yammering for about 20 minutes. I especially want to hear from my, my school psych and my MFT folks about how much you've talked about case formulation in your other courses. You may not have called it case formulation. We may call it something else, but I mean it follows very similarly when we get a student in um, that say we're looking at a specific learning disability. We have to go through and say, okay, what's their education history? Um, are there any other tests that have ever been done before? Because we have to it, we have to rule out lack of education. We have to rule out, you know, family things, other things that could possibly be causing it. And then we also need to look at. Um, patterns that we see because of race, race or ethnicity as well. Um, and make sure that those are all rolled out and then test as well, either do cognitive tests or do an intervention and say, okay, if this intervention doesn't work, then we're probably looking at an SLD or we're probably looking at this. And then kind of, it kind of follows the same thing. We do a game plan. Um, so like, it makes sense because we, I was just thinking that I was like, it's very similar to what we do when we're trying to figure out our problem. And it definitely is, Tristan. It's the same sort of process, right? Um, you might be calling it slightly different words or using different terms, but it's the same thing, right? Like I'm, I'm building my idea, my story of what's happening here. And here's what I think's going on. Let's test it out. Oh, turns out this person just didn't have access to educational resources, right? 
we gave them extra intervention and yeah, they don't have a learning disability. They were just behind because they had switched schools five times, right? Or whatever it happens to be. So yeah, great. Yeah. Other thoughts or questions, things making sense. Okay. I was just going to say, they call it the problem analysis mm -hmm. in school cycle. It's our problem analysis cycle. It's very, very, very much the same thing. Yep. Uh, we just use a slightly different terminology in the therapy as opposed to the school cycle aspect. So, yeah. so, nothing too crazy yet. No one's like, ah, oh, he's off his rocker. None of this makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I might be off my rocker. At least it still makes sense. Yeah. So, you know, if we would talk about um, kind of the visual process of developing the case formulation, it's really, really similar to when we are talking about doing science, right? So, when we talk about doing scientific research and work, the very first thing we have to do is we identify, you know, what the problem is. And that problem could be, why is this child not reading at grade level? That problem could be, why is there so much conflict between the parent and this child? Or that problem could be, you know, this child's uh, weight is way below normal standards for their age and height. Um, and maybe we call that anorexia or something. So we have to identify first what the problem is. Then we have to gather information about that problem. And in scientific research, that's doing things like going to the research literature and seeing who studied this kind of topic before. For us, that's the same thing. We go to the research literature. What is there out there about parental child conflict? What is there out there about ADHD? And I go and I learn more about that problem. In other words, I'm learning more about that nomothetic theory of what's going on. And then I start to make my hypotheses. Okay, well, in general, this is why children with ADHD struggle with X or Y. So let's see, how does that fit with this particular child that I'm working with? And then based on those hypotheses, we conduct our tests. For us, those tests are interventions, right? We do an intervention for family as a whole, child, at school, whatever it happens to be. And then we ask ourselves, okay, does the evidence now support that hypothesis that I made? My hypothesis, this intervention will cause this change in this problem. Did it? Did it cause that change that we thought was going to happen? If it didn't, that's where we have to keep that open mind and say, oh, well, that was a bad hypothesis, right? That didn't work. Let's go back up here, learn more, start again, make a new hypothesis, try a new intervention. Maybe the evidence did support the hypothesis. That's great. Keep it up, right? Keep doing it. That feeds back into our case formulation our ideographic theory about this person. And we use that to then better understand the person we're working with, the family we're working with, and then we continue that process. Here's more interventions that we'd be doing. Here's you know, more information that we're gathering, but we're still always keeping that open mind. And we're still always keeping that open mind because there could be new evidence that then shifts. Right? And it says, oh, this does not fit with what's going on here. And then we need to go back to the site. Or we say, okay, that did fit, that did work. Now, great, we're getting better and better and better at understanding this particular individual. Now, where a lot of people who are out there practicing go wrong is at this step where they either don't actually gather evidence to see if their hypothesis is supported, or they see the evidence doesn't support their hypothesis, but they still keep doing it. So this is what we see with people who do non-effective therapies or pseudoscientific therapies. 
where we know, for example, this doesn't actually change this particular behavior. Or the reason the behavior changed is not because of your intervention. And yet someone would continue to engage in using those non-effective interventions. Now, we'll read a lot more across the semester and we'll talk a lot more in a few weeks about kind of the reasons why people don't realize that what they're doing is ineffective. And it has a lot to do with placebo effects and what we call regression to the mean. But you'll, we'll talk more about that. And this really, this is what you don't want. This is the flowchart of non-evidence-based practice. And sadly, like you will see, when you get out there and you're doing your practical work and you're working in the schools and you're interacting with systems, you're going to see a lot of people following this flowchart instead of the other one. Where you start the same by gathering the information about the problem, by making hypotheses, but then you just ignore anything that doesn't support that. You just count all the evidence that shows that you're wrong, and then you just keep that idea forever and ever and ever until you retire. Right? So we'll see a lot of these. Go ahead, Elijah, go ahead. Do you, do you think that uh, sometimes that ignoring of uh, evidence leads to things like overdiagnosis of, of things, something like ADHD in the United States? Undoubtedly, because what you're doing is a lot of times you're not getting a good case formulation and you're ignoring things that don't fit right your case formulation. So you already make some sort of snap judgment. Oh, this child has ADHD, this child has schizophrenia or whatever it is. And you ignore all the other evidence that could discount that, disprove it. That's why that an open mind is so crucial. Right. Like you gotta think, are you looking at the school and what they're doing? What's the what's the teacher doing with the child to help solve the problem? What are the parents doing? What is it like at home? You know, those are those are really key parts of uh conceptualization that, that isn't necessarily always taken into complete account, it feels. Yeah, well and, and that's why there's a huge difference between what we call diagnostic formulation case formulation right diagnostic formulation is simply descriptive it says this child fits these symptoms which means they qualify for this diagnosis that doesn't tell you anything at all about how to intervene it doesn't tell you anything at all about the ideology of the program of the problem and it doesn't help you be a good evidence-based practitioner all it does is tell you oh Here's the surface level things that are happening. Um, when I was working in, in Arkansas, for example, um, I got into a little bit of a, uh, a discussion or a fight, if you will, with someone who was giving a presentation at a conference and was talking about how, you know, the eight is specifically about ADHD and how, you know, it's, I think he said something insane like, you know, half the children in our school system, you know, qualify for ADHD. I was like, well, no, they don't. First of all, the rates are like 5%. Uh, he's like, oh, no, 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 no. I've got all these problems. Uh, and he used the phrase specifically, well, if it, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, then it's a duck. And I said, well, what about all the other waterfowl that are out there that all have webbed feet and waddle and make similar kinds of noises? Or maybe what about all the different species of ducks that are out there? They're not all the same duck. Uh, and so he didn't invite me back again uh, to the presentation. But, uh, but that's what we see a lot, though, is here's this kind of surface level understanding of a problem that, okay, maybe, you know, if we just go diagnostically, they could fit that diagnosis. But what else is going on? Um, we know, for example, that anxiety has severe, severe impairments in things like concentration and attention, right, as do depression. Um, so if I'm only saying, oh, they're having problems concentrating, 
okay, well, I can think of like 30 different reasons why they could be having problems constantly. Maybe they're hungry, right? Maybe they don't have enough food to eat at home. Or maybe they're anxious. Or maybe their clothes are too small and they're uncomfortable, right? Because they can't fit it. Or maybe they need glasses and they can't see the damn board, right? Like there's all these different hypotheses that you have to account for before you would then say, okay, well, here's the diagnosis. Here's the real thing that's going on. Right. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, just, I, I tend to think a lot uh, in, in ways of uh, systemic types type of therapy. Uh, so that, that happens to make a lot of sense to me. And I'm sure a lot of my MFT cohorts as well. Yeah, well, and, and it's and it's it's all about that understanding of not just an internal environment, not just an external environment, but that interaction, right? Uh, and we have to kind of account for the entire thing. Good question. Wow. Let's uh, let's take a break. We've been going for about an hour or so. Let's take a little like five six minute break. Stretch, walk around, blink, uh, put some eye drops in, whatever you got to do, uh, and I'll see you guys in about five minutes. Okay. All right. Well, so getting back to where we left off, uh, talking about case formulation. So it's really the very first thing that you need to do in therapy. Uh, you do that before you start really doing any kind of treatment planning. Because if you don't have a good case formulation, then how are you going to know what to do in the treatment? Because your case formulation really provides um, the, the map, the guide to your treatment planning. They're a sequential process. Because knowing why someone is having the particular problems that they are helps tell you how to fix those problems. If you don't do that, or if you just start doing the treatment, then it's the equivalent of you taking your car to a mechanic and they don't ask you what's wrong with it. They don't start it up, they don't drive it around. They just start swapping parts out and seeing, does it work now? which would probably be very profitable for the mechanic, right? But it wouldn't be very good for you as the consumer. And it's the same thing with your clients that you work with, where if we don't know why they're having the problem, then why would we know how to treat it? Or how would we know how to treat it? So that's really what we're talking about when we talk about this relationship between case formulation and treatment plan. Because it's your guide, right? It's your guide on how to do treatment. Um, it tells us, you know, what te techniques we're going to use at what time and how we're going to do that. So me doing cognitive restructuring work with an eight-year-old is going to look very different than I'm, I'm working with an 18-year-old. If I am doing parent management training for a child who has autism versus a child who has anxiety, those things are going to look different. And that's what your case formulation does is it helps to, again, tailor those interventions specifically to who you're working with. So, again, it's really all about improving our practice. Having solid formulation improves our ability to help the clients and the people that we're working with. Because it helps link together theory, the research that's out there, and then our practice. It also really helps to um, normalize problems. So it's all too easy for when parents bring a kid in, uh, you're seeing a kid in the schools, the parents start saying, here's what's going on, here's the problems, here's the problems, here's the problems. And sometimes maybe those kids uh, that you're interacting with, or those adolescents that you're interacting with, are not the most pleasant people in the world to be around. Right? Maybe, maybe they've got 
uh, LJD, right? So little jackass disorder. Um, maybe they're just annoying, right? And you're thinking to yourself, I don't enjoy this person. Or maybe I don't enjoy this parent. One of the things that a good CBT formulation does is it helps to normalize that. It's a lot harder to get frustrated and upset with someone when you realize why it is they're doing what they're doing. And how that's, of course, exactly what they should be doing based on their learning history and based on their environment right now. I may not like it still, but now I understand why they're engaging in those behaviors, why they're having those kinds of you know, thoughts. And that really helps to increase your empathy and your understanding of the clients, as well as to help make sure that you maintain a solid therapeutic relationship. Because now I get it, right? Like, yeah, if you were somebody you know that I met on the street, yeah, I might not want to interact with you much. But now I understand why you're having the problems that you're having, which allows me to be a better clinician. The formulation also helps you to organize very large amounts of very complex information. Because again, like I mentioned at the very start of this class, all of us have this enormous ecosystem of information that we can gather about any person. Right? Um, going back to their birth, right? And going back to what's happening with them, who all they're interacting with, what's going on. There's a lot of information out there. But having a good formulation allows you to sort through what's useful and not useful. And we'll see that in a minute. It also allows those of you who are early in your career to actually get high quality supervision. It allows your supervisor to help guide your thought process, to help scaffold your ability to choose interventions, uh, and to give you that feedback about whether or not things are working. So lots and lots of stuff about having good formulation improves the practice that you do. And a big part of that practice, of course, is your intervening and what interventions you're using or not. So the formulation helps you to select what interventions you're going to be using, help sequence those interventions appropriately to suggest, okay, well, what's going to be useful about knowing how this person likes to change or what's a way that they have changed in the past? I'll give you an example. So this um, client that I'm working with right now, this 11-year-old I mentioned earlier, who has trick as well as anxiety problems and medical issues and developmental delays. Um, they were really struggling this last week when I met with them, like her tricks getting better, anxiety is way better. She had a big medical episode and her behavior just kind of spiraled where she was being very oppositional um, and now has kind of spiraled more into passivity or almost a depression. Not wanting to do her basic hygiene, not wanting to, you know, do schoolwork, things like that. Um, so as part of her formulation, the information I gathered was, okay, well, what have things been worse versus better in the past? And one of the big things that we found out was she responds very, very well to immediate reinforcement. Shockingly, shockingly, just like most of us. Right? Um, and she responds well to structure and order. So we started planning, okay, well, let's implement some more structure and order, external rather than internal for her at first, right? Because it seems like that's worked well in the past. Well, we tried that. We put a checklist out for her to do to make sure she knows what to do. Okay, did you do anything with that checklist? What do you mean? She just didn't do it, so she didn't check it. Okay, do you do things just simply because you do them, or do you do them for a reason? Well, a lot of us adults, for example, like me, I brushed my teeth and I showered today because I won't, don't want to be gross and disgusting, even when I'm seeing you through the, the screen. Right? Um, 
she doesn't care. Okay, well, she doesn't have a whole lot of external or uh, intrinsic motivation. So we need to place more extrinsic motivational aspects of play, right? So what do we need to do? We don't just give her a checklist. We give her a checklist and we tie very specific reinforcement to doing those things on the checklist. And we also knew from her formulation how much she looks up to her two big brothers. So guess what? Brothers also got checklists with specific reinforcement. So she's got both immediate, you know, token economy reinforcement plus social aspects in play that will help to change her behavior. Now, if I didn't have a good formulation, we might not have known those things. Um, and so, you know, that's what I'm talking about when I say that it suggests a person's preferred way of changing. What's helped in the past achieve different kinds of change? So another one of the big aspects about doing good formulation work is that it helps us to be on the lookout for roadblocks, um, you know, blockages to therapy, what are called therapy interfering behaviors. What are things that are going to make therapy not work as well or maybe be trickier? And those could be things like uh, financial aspects or transportation. Those could be things like uh, lack of social support. Those could be cultural issues. Those could be educational issues. They could be medical problems. All sorts of things that could happen there. But your formulation is going to help you understand some of those. And then finally, your CBT formulation helps inform the intervention by saying, what's going to be the most effective, most cost efficient things for us to do? I'll give you an example. So um, we've got some really great therapies for PTSD uh, in children and adults. So I'll use an adult example. Though. So we've got uh, prolonged exposure therapy. We've got cognitive processing therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, sort of generally speaking, um, works great. But we also have this behavioral protocol called written exposure therapy. Um, that's five sessions as opposed to 12 to 16 for these others. And so if my formulation suggests that this would be a useful uh, intervention for this particular person, and I can choose an intervention that takes a third of the amount of time but still shows the same effect, that's what I should do. Um, if I'm working with kids and it's like, okay, well, we can do two hours of play therapy a week for the next two years, and maybe we'll see some change, or we can do 10 sessions of parent management training. Well, I wonder which one of those maybe we should do, right? Which one's gonna be more effective and more cost efficient? Um, and that's what your formulation in part helps you figure out. Now, this goes back to what Elijah had asked about earlier in terms of, kind of diagnostic versus case formulation. Uh, case formulation often uh, subsumes or, or you know, includes that diagnostic formulation, but it goes very, very far beyond that. Right? Uh, diagnostic formulations like the DSM or the ICD, uh, they're really just descriptive, right? They're just symptom-based. They're a theoretical in that they're not saying here's why people have problems they just exist right um, case formulation on the other hand is very highly individualized it's always derived from theory right so for example uh, we'll be talking in this class a lot about cognitive behavioral case formulation that comes out of cognitive behavioral theory uh, and case formulation is explanatory. Here's why this person's having this problem. Right? Here's what causes them to have this problem. So I often get a diagnostic formulation on the way to my case formulation, but I don't just stop at the diagnostic formulation. Because that doesn't that doesn't tell me what I need to do. It might tell me what box to check on an insurance reimbursement. But it doesn't tell me what I should do now after I check that box. So it's really, it's a step on the way 
to formulation, but it's not the entire formulation. You just keep that in mind. So there's a number of different ways to think about case formulation. Um, one of my favorite child clinicians, uh, Robert Friedberg, refers to what he calls the case formulation wardrobe. And he calls it the wardrobe because there's a lot of different aspects to clothes. Right? So um, all of you that I can see on the screen right now appear to be wearing clothes. First, thank you. Um, appreciate that. I think we all appreciate it. Um, and all you, you don't seem to probably be just wearing one single item, right? Like no one's just wearing like a robe or something. Uh, you might be, I can't see below. It's, it could happen, but I'm just going to pretend it's not. Um, so like me, so I'm wearing, I'm wearing shirt, right? I've got jeans on, I've got socks, I've got underwear, I've got shoes, I've got a belt, uh, I've got glasses. I've got all these different pieces of my wardrobe. And case formulation is the same thing, right? Case formulation isn't just one component. It's not just one piece, right? It's not just a shirt. It's not just pants. It's not just socks. It's the entire wardrobe. And fitting these different pieces together in your case formulation wardrobe gives you a useful, what Friedberg refers to as a dressed up picture of your client. And looking at this um, picture here gives you an idea of kind of what is that wardrobe, right? What are the different parts to that wardrobe? Because again, it's not just one part. It's not just the cultural context. It's not just their history and development. It's not just their cognitions or behaviors or emotions. It's not just the diagnostic aspect. You have to put all of these pieces together to truly have a good, solid case formulation that accounts for, yes, the behavioral aspects in terms of antecedents, consequences, their history and development, the cultural context that they're existing within, uh, their cognitive predispositions or the cognitive structures they have. But we have to know all of these pieces to really get an understanding of why they're presenting with the problems that they're presenting. If I just focus on any one piece in this wardrobe, I'm not going to be very well dressed. Just like all of you, if you only went out wearing one piece of your wardrobe, right now you might get a little chilly, right? Or you might have the cops called on you for a decent exposure um, or whatever it would happen to be. So we have to take all these different aspects into account to understand why is someone having the physiological symptoms, the mood or emotional symptoms, the behavioral problems, the cognitive problems, the personal problems that they're experiencing right now. And when we start putting that together, that allows us to understand both why the symptoms they're having are being had and how those symptoms interact with each other, as well as influencing these wardrobe pieces. So for example, my physiological symptoms that I experience can have a huge important impact on my cognition. The interpersonal consequences that I experience can have a huge impact on my familial system. My history and development has a big impact on my behavior and my cognitions and my mood. But at the same time, my behavior, my cognitions feed back into all of these aspects. So case formulation isn't just a one-way arrow, right? These things all influence and are influencing each other. And so in order to understand where do I need to intervene and how do I need to intervene, that's why I have to have this whole wardrobe, right? the entire dressed up picture. Because otherwise I may not be doing the right thing. 
And even with a good case formulation, I may not intervene in the right aspect. And that's where you have to be so open to being wrong. Where you have to be okay with your hypothesis not being supported. And then say, all right, let's try again. I tried to intervene here at the physiological level, and it didn't work. Okay, great. Now, well, now I need to intervene at the behavioral level. Or I tried to intervene by, you know, addressing cultural aspects, but they didn't help. So now I need to address these behavioral aspects as well. Or, for a lot of us, we'll address multiple pieces of this at the same time in order to try and be as effective as we can. So, this little girl that I mentioned earlier, this 11-year-old, right? if, if I think about her case formulation, I have a lot of history and development to talk about. Um, she was an international adoption. Um, she, you know, we knew information about her birth mother, but nothing about her birth father. Birth mother had a lot of cognitive deficits and problems. It was a state-run institution. Um, so we know kind of history and development. We know that she struggled a lot very early with a lot of developmental aspects. Um, so I can gather all that information, but that alone doesn't tell me why she's experiencing the pulling behavior she is or the anxiety that she is. And I can talk about the cultural context that she exists in right now as a you know, a person of color who's been adopted by a Caucasian family living in a primarily Caucasian area, you know, going to a mostly Caucasian school, and I can talk about cultural aspects of her particular family, right? So not large scale, but like miniature scale cultural aspects, um, you know, where mom and dad are both very highly educated, very highly motivated. Other two siblings in the home are both um, gifted. Uh, in terms of academic abilities, it's not. Uh, lots of emphasis placed on academic success there, right? So I can talk about those cultural aspects, but that alone, again, doesn't tell me what's going on. Cognitive structures and predispositions, yeah, we assess those as well. She seems to be very prone to being anxious, uh, very prone to interpreting situations, uh, in a very negative light, um, we know that you know her cognitive um, abilities are a little bit delayed compared to her peers, and so she uh, often has a hard time making friends, uh, keeping friends. That alone doesn't tell me again about why she's experiencing that. Behavioral antecedents and consequences. Um, she was when I started seeing her. Uh, throwing up two to three times per week at school and going home as a result of that. She wasn't having that because of her medical issues. She was having that because of very clear anxiety issues that were then being reinforced by her environment. She'd throw up and then she'd keep throwing up until finally she was able to go, go home. So one of the first things we addressed was that. Right. But that alone doesn't tell us why is she having these other problems? Right? Why is she having the anxiety in the first place? Why is she pulling her hair out? Why is there having the conflict with the parent? But when I start putting all these different aspects together, and I start looking at the presenting problems that she's having and breaking it down into those specific physiological, cognitive, emotional, mood-based, interpersonal pieces, now I can start getting a really good understanding of this individual and how we intervene. So within two weeks of our first meeting, for example, she had stopped throwing up at school and has not thrown up since in the last two months at school, which means she's going to school now all the time, which shockingly has improved her home life because the parents are not having to, in their words, nag and harass her about doing her schoolwork all the time because she's at school doing her schoolwork which has led to a change in the cultural context right 
and it's starting to see some big changes in her cognitive structures and predisposition because she's not as worried about school when she's home. So we start seeing all these changes in these different aspects because we started intervening right here in particular. But then also I intervened here. And we started talking to the parents about things like, okay, well, you know, is it the most important thing for her right now that she gets the highest possible grade she can on her assignments? Or do we need to worry about her physiology and her well-being first? And then see what happens in school. Oh, I guess so. I guess maybe we don't have to worry about that as much as I thought. Well, we're in the middle of a pandemic and she wasn't getting the you know, resources and support that she needed academically. So maybe let's focus on health and well-being first, and then we'll see what happens with this other part. Um, and it turns out we saw some pretty nice changes. Right? So you can intervene at these different aspects and then see changes across the system. Because these are all working together. Now I've got some other Nice pictures about that too. Uh, but let me pause, talk, feedback, questions, thoughts, responses for you. So I'm hearing you say from the beginning, back with one of the three key elements is keeping it simple as possible, which mm -hmm. I totally important and think is necessary but then you know you see this and as a person, you think you do need all this information but it's maybe are you talking about like how you retrieve the information just kind of through the like can you walk me through that um how to keep this simple <laughs> well and, it, and it's it's about knowing what information you need mm -hmm. and about organizing that information mm -hmm. And so things like this and the other kinds of, uh, you know, visuals that we'll see help mm -hmm. you organize that information mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as opposed to just, well, tell me about what's going on. Sure. Yeah. Well, what does that mean? Yeah. Like, who knows what you're going to get there? Right. Okay, let's do a little bit of first of, let's talk about her history. Let's talk about developmental aspects. Okay. Let's talk about your specific familial culture, right? Okay, now we're gonna assess cognitive aspects. Now we're gonna assess behavioral aspects. And so instead of just this wide open, like, mm -hmm. uh, give, me, give me what's the problem? It's like, no, let me break that problem down. Right? Let me ask about these specific pieces that I know I'm gonna need to fit together, but that also means that I know what stuff I, you know, don't need. Right, that I that I can ignore. Mm -hmm. right. Like, for example, uh, dad's occupation doesn't really have an impact at all on what's going on. Mom's does because she's a teacher, and she was trying to be more of a teacher rather than a mom to this particular kid. So that aspect of the culture context, yeah, let's think about that. Dad's job doesn't really have an impact, right? Like, like it's, it's pretty much like not impacting. Um, history and development, like, did I need to know specifically when she had achieved various kinds of developmental milestones? Nope. You know why? I can't go back and change those, right? Like, that's a decade in the past. You know, I need to know that she's generally cognitively delayed and that, you know, she had at least one parent who was the same way. Yes, that becomes important. So, you know, out of all of that history and information, there's just certain parts of it that are going to be very important. And that's why I'm talking about keeping it simple as opposed to, you know, here's her life story, you know, volume one, uh, ages zero to two, right? <laughs> volume two. No, we don't need all that. We just need the important parts. And that's where things like this, the wardrobe, you start taking the important parts out. Does that answer, Emily? Yeah, no, that was great. And I was assuming kind of to that degree um, and having a structure is is helpful so that you can process and you can create your assessment and your, yeah, it makes sense. Yep. Yeah, because otherwise, if you don't have something like this, then what are you doing? Right? You're just 
asking questions based on whatever you happen to pop through your mind right right now um, as opposed to here's my you know comprehensive assessment and information so with this model uh, and this wardrobe um, obviously it, it, it is cognitive behavioral um, but is do you think it allows for enough flexibility in terms of like the emotion behind each person and them facing the problem sure and, and, and allowing allowing that to uh also take some part in the decision making on um interventions yeah because um I, and i'll give you an example with this case i've been talking about so um the mother is uh, relatively high strung right um and she's pretty prone to anxiety herself um, and she has a history of, um, you know, kind of being pushed and pushing other people to, you know, be the top, the best, the best, the best, the best. Um, and so knowing that information about her, I can, and other information I gathered, I can do sort of a case formulation for her as well, right? That then gets moved into this cultural context right? for my identified patient the little girl but i'm doing this kind of thing with all these other people in the system to the degree that i need to um, know that information does that make sense okay yeah that does make sense did you end up doing a uh, a genogram with this family at all no i honestly never did a genogram in my life. okay i was curious uh, I, I, I didn't need to, uh, but that would fall kind of under this cultural context aspect, right? Where um, I'm understanding the family structure and what's going on. So uh, I talked about siblings, right, with them, um, mom and dad, relationships between them, other important parental or grandparental or caregivers that are in there. You know, so you're thinking about that system. And I'm thinking about how is this change going to impact the different aspects of the system. But I'm thinking about it still from a, you know, how do I intervene? Well, I intervene at a, primarily a behavioral level. Um, right. okay. And that's what we're doing and seeing how that intervening behaviorally shifts the other people. So, for example, I behaviorally intervened with the parents, changing theirs specifically. So, how did that then um, change the behavior of my identified patient? Um, so, I'm not, you know, changing her behavior directly. I'm having the parents change theirs, right? Which is a systematic level intervention. And then you're seeing what the impacts or the results are on the rest of the system. So it's the same sort of intervening, right, um, that you would do if I was taking a, a Bowenian or something like that, you know, a structural family approach or something, you know, to that nature. Um, but you're not focusing on, okay, let's just somehow change the system. You're saying, okay, well, how am I going to change the system? And it's this particular piece will change right here that then changes everything. Does that make sense? Yeah, that, that makes a lot more sense. Okay, certainly. Thank you. Yeah. Other thoughts, questions, concerns? I'm curious is when, um, when you have a, a situation where she's having difficulties at school, do you have to conceptualize that as far as thinking will i have to get some involvement within the school as well is that something you conceptualize in the beginning oh yeah of course um and i do i do a large amount of uh, communication with the school systems whether that's individual teachers or school psychs or aides or uh, counselors or whoever it happens to be that they're interacting with for those specific aspects um, Okay. So, you know, 
for this girl, for example, um, she is a very, very strong advocate in the mom. And so um, the mom's a teacher, she knows that system. So I can give that information to the mom and then she can effectively interface with that system. In others, I have to interface with that myself uh, and say, hey, I need to have a call or a conference or I'm sending a letter. Um, and I have to do that pretty frequently. And that's part of your formulation. So um, I'll give you I'll give you guys a good example. Um, a couple of years ago, I had a, a girl who's referred to me. She was 12, 13. Um, and she was referred to me because she was having seizures. Um, but she was having what are called PNES, psychogenic non-epileptic seizures. Uh, so in other words, she was showing seizure behavior, but she was not having seizure activity in her brain. Um, and this is a form of um, a large scale form of what we call conversion disorder. So where I'm having um, physical manifestations of uh, psychological and emotional distress. So this girl, when she saw me, hadn't been in school for about six months. Um, over the last three months before she saw me, she had had 74 seizures, seizure episodes. Uh, so almost daily. Um, she was pretty much housebound, uh, hadn't left the house in about a month and a half to do anything or go anywhere. Um, and she was, she was having a rough time. They were really, really distressed. Uh, the school did not want her to come back to school because it was too much of a liability. Right? They were too worried about her safety. They weren't worried about her safety. They were worried about their own safety. Um, and that they you know, couldn't accommodate uh, someone with that level of problem. Now, three weeks after we started seeing each other, I had her back in school. Um, and that took me interfacing with the school, right? Talking with her teachers, the principals, the nurse there. This is a smaller rural school um, to help them understand why her staying home and her being sent home anytime she had a seizure was the exact opposite of what we needed to do. Because for her, what happened was she was having panic symptoms, right? Panic attack symptoms that were then building and building and building until she eventually had this seizure-like behavior as a result of having a panic attack. So what did we do? We treated the panic attacks. Now she also had pretty severe trauma, which is why she had this in the first place. So we treated that first. Um, and then when that was going down, we started working on the panic attacks. Um, and then we started working on getting her back in school. And so, yes, Marcy, so yeah. Uh, lots of interaction there, lots of letters to uh, the principal explaining why uh, if they weren't allowing her to be in school, that would be a violation of various uh, federal aspects of educational law. Uh, and getting the parents educated and able to tell them those same things. So being able to be their own advocates for, uh, for their daughter. So yes, lots of inter interacting with the school systems, for sure. All right, others, other questions, thoughts? Okay. How willing are schools typically to work with, um, with therapists? Uh, it, I mean, uh, it varies a lot, a lot. Uh, and it varies with the people within the schools, right? So you may have a teacher who's very eager and motivated to assist, but you then have another teacher who is not on board. Um, so it, it's it's incredibly variable. <laughs> um, I would say that generally reminding them that, um, you know, either the parents or someone like myself uh, know what the law says and why they will or will not be in violation of the law if they don't do these things is a very effective motivator for most of those systems. Uh, so. Sounds like it could get quite frustrating at times, I'd imagine. Oh, yeah, yeah, um, especially for the parents, right? Because 
they're like, oh, we need to do this. And then schools aren't doing that necessarily, or a teacher isn't doing that. Although another teacher is, and so you see this child's behavior kind of or performance going up and down and up and down, uh, again, based on those kinds of external uh, aspects, you know, consequences, uh, and it becomes very frustrating. The questions, the questions. So when we, um, you know, are thinking about problems, we need to think beyond just a uh, diagnostic level or a referral question level to move to this again specific or a case problem level. So if someone says, oh, uh, hey, Dr. Lack, we're referring you uh, a patient. Oh, okay, what for? Oh, they have Tourette's. Okay. Does that tell me much? It doesn't, right? It doesn't tell me a whole lot. It tells me that they would meet criteria for this disorder, perhaps, uh, or maybe not, because it turns out lots of people are terrible at diagnosing. Um, but that they're likely to have motor and vocal tics and they've had them for a while and that's all that tells me. doesn't tell me what kind of tics they are, it doesn't tell me anything about uh, their environment, it doesn't tell me about comorbid problems they're experiencing. Uh, I just get a very, very general sort of surfacey level understanding of what's going on that may or may not be that accurate. So when we, we take those problems and we break them down, we can actually become much more effective at understanding what's happening with someone and then how do we intervene. So most of our mental health issues that we deal with can actually be divided into these five specific parts. Uh, depression, anxiety, OCD, anorexia, autism, um, oppositional behavior, ADHD, they can all be broken down into these five aspects that allow us to then get a better understanding of this person and what they're experiencing. So those aspects are cognitive, physiological, behavioral, emotional, and interpersonal. And just like we saw in this picture, these all interact with each other, right? So there, there's interactions between all these aspects. But if I have someone who says, what's the presenting problem, ADHD, well, that doesn't tell me a whole lot. Let's break it down into what you know, specific behavioral problems they're experiencing, what cognitive impacts there are, how they're having personal difficulties, uh, emotional or mood problems, and then any physiological aspects of that. And when I start doing that, and I start breaking these problems down, all of a sudden, now I can get a better understanding of what's going on with this person. So we oftentimes in therapy will get referrals uh, that say things like, oh, this person has uh, low self-esteem. What the hell does that mean? Right? Well, I, don't, I don't know what that means. Like maybe I have an idea of what it means to me, but what does that look like, right? How do you treat low self-esteem. You know, is there a low self-esteem manual? Is there a diagnosis for low self-esteem? Like, what, what does that look like? Well, we don't know what it looks like until we start actually breaking it down into those particular components. So if we look at someone who, you know, is often you know, uh, characterized as having low self-esteem, well, they have very specific behavioral deficits uh, or excesses, like shying away from things that are difficult or things that are new. Uh, maybe they're pretty passive, maybe they give up easily, uh, maybe they are prone to large amounts of crying or whining or whatever it is. And all of a sudden, now I'm starting to understand what does this low self-esteem look like? Maybe it looks like someone who's very irritable and anxious and sad. Those are the emotional states that are problem. Maybe it looks like someone who doesn't have a lot of friends or a lot of positive social interactions with parents. Maybe they have a lot of physiological complaints, primarily as a result of their anxiety. 
And maybe they're having specific kinds of repeated thoughts that are contributing to those behaviors or those emotional states. I'm not good. People don't like me. Uh, I'm never doing right. And when I break that low self-esteem down into these different aspects, what that does is that starts allowing me to say, okay, now I understand the problem, which means now I can start intervening. So, for example, we have uh, interventions for cognitive distortions and cognitive misinterpretation. We have interventions for reducing your physiological arousal. We have interventions for people with poor interpersonal skills. We have interventions that actually target emotional distress specifically. And we have interventions obviously the target behavioral aspects. So when I start breaking this down, instead of saying that, well, I'm gonna fix your low self-esteem, we're saying, now we know what the problems are, and now we can start planning on how to deal with those specific problems. And then that formulation becomes useful, because now I know what to do. Make sense? Thoughts? Something that I was curious about is, so then once you have these particular components, is that whenever you, and I'm assuming either the client or if it's a child, their family member would share these with you or the teacher would, for example, and you gather this information, do you then invite the client to help you choose which manual or which idea you want to start with working on first or if through your gathering of information you can make that decision um, of where your starting point would be yeah so that's, that's a great question um so in general like for me when i'm formulating these problems i have an idea about which ones are most likely going to be effective first or the most impact and that's based on my formulation, that's based on the research literature. But part of that is also based on, like I talked about earlier, their preferred means of change. So your formulation helps inform which of these are gonna be most effective. And then as part of doing good cognitive behavioral therapy, what we always do is we're very open about what we're doing, right? It's not just like, all right, I'm gonna start intervening, I'm not going to tell you why. I just want you to do this, right? No. It's very open in that we share our case formulation with our clients in a developmentally appropriate fashion and with their families. And then we talk to them about the interventions based on that formulation and why we think those things are going to be the most effective. Now, there certainly can be instances where it's like, well, we could do one of these two things. Uh, which one would you like to try first? That might be very appropriate. Um, but a lot of times it's going to be, well, based on the research and based on my skill and knowledge, this is what we need to try first. So if, for example, I had somebody come in with PTSD and I do an assessment and they're having specific types of problems associated with that diagnosis, there's different therapies out there that are effective. But their formulation will probably help inform which one of those therapies is going to be the best choice first. And then you share that with them, get their feedback on your formulation, get their feedback on what the interventions that you know, the formulation indicates are and their comfortable level with them. And then you start moving forward from there. So lots of openness, lots of sharing. Is there a certain amount of um, humility, you would say, in making these decisions with the client um, in terms of like making that decision and being OK with being wrong uh, and, and being honest about that with them? Oh, yeah. Lots of that. Um, the way that I, I always frame it with any of my patients is, you know, based on my understanding right now, this seems like the thing to do. Let's try it and see what happens. Um, I don't do, you know, like promises or anything like that, or like, this is definitely going to change your life in the next three days, you know, 
it's like, hey, you know, based on the data, based on the information you're giving me, this is probably the thing that we should do. Um, let's test it out, try it out. If it doesn't work, then we'll revisit this and we'll try something else. But let's try this one first. And that's where that kind of openness to being wrong is. And like, I'm okay. If it doesn't work, I'm not like, oh my God, I'm the worst therapist ever. I'm terrible. It's like, well, that didn't work. Uh, so my formulation wasn't that great. We're going to have to do something else. Right. You're just making the best decision that you can with the information that's given. Which is all any of us can do. Uh, and and being very open about that with your, your clients, I think, is very important. Uh, there are all too many of these non-scientific practitioners, pseudoscientific practitioners, who make these very, very bold statements and claims. Um, you know, whether it's someone who's saying, you know, well, you can stop smoking through hypnosis, uh, or, oh, well, we'll treat your long-standing trauma problems in, you know, five minutes, you know, with magic tapping or whatever it is. Um, you know, that's not what good scientific practitioners do. Right? We say, okay, based on the evidence, based on the data, this seems like it will probably work but we have to test it out, right? We have to try, um, and we have to collect data to see whether or not it does work, right? Um, because I'm not just gonna rely on, oh, well, I think it works, because I have all sorts of biases that would like me to make it work, right? Because um, I want to not suck, uh, and I want to be good at what I do. And so of course I want my patients uh, but I need data to actually allow me to test those hypotheses. And that's part of being very open, I think, is sharing that kind of data and that information. Uh, and whether you're, you know, getting repeated behavioral measures or parent reports or self-reports or, um, you know, observational data, whatever you're getting, you need to get it so that you can check your progress and test your hypothesis as well. Um, so, you know, for this uh, little girl I mentioned with the trick, trichotillomania, part of our uh, data that we're doing is weekly photographs of the problem areas. And we're keeping those as part of her data set so that we can refer to those. So I'm not saying like, well, I think it's worse or I think it's better. It's like, no, let's look at today's photo versus three weeks ago. Um, and so, you know, that's the kind of data that we might use for something like that. Now, if I'm doing, you know, treating uh, Tourette's, then I've got some wonderful, uh, you know, parent report measures that look at impairment, that look at uh, severity of, of ticks. Um, and then I also do things like I do frequency counts in sessions. Uh, of the number of ticks that people are experiencing. Um, and I compare that to previous sessions. So you're, you're gathering this data to test your hypothesis. Uh, and this is crucial because if you just rely on self-report of, well, how are things this week? Do you think things are getting better? You're going to see a lot of biases at play, and it turns out people are terrible at remembering things. Um, so having more solid data allows you to actually test those hypotheses better. Um, you don't see a lot of data collection and gathering in people who are not doing good evidence-based practice. Um, you just see a lot of that relying on you know, verbal report or, oh, I think they're doing better, as opposed to, well, let's see what the data actually says. And they do this thing that they weren't able to do before whether that's reading or whether that's using a public restroom or whether that's whatever it happens to be. Um, gathering that data is crucial to being able to know, is my hypothesis supported or not? Otherwise, you're just making shit up. Um, and I know those of you from our counseling and school psych backgrounds have had classes in the assessment stuff a lot. 
which is nice. Um, our MFT folks haven't had all those assessment courses, but we can certainly get you uh, access to various assessments to help track those things for your simulations. All right, other questions, thoughts right now? Nope. All right. So one of the other, um, you know, aspects of your wardrobe, right? we've got a presenting problem, data that helps inform that, but we've got this socio-cultural context. Um, anytime we look at a family, that family doesn't just exist in some sort of bubble. That family, whether it's their parenting practices or their beliefs about mental health or whatever, exists within a greater cultural bubble. Um, so when I talk about sociocultural context, I'm not just talking about things like larger scale racial and ethnic identity. I'm also talking about this family's particular socioculture. Because Okay, look, it's a it's a family, it's a Latino family uh, living here in Oklahoma City. Okay, well, how much does that tell me about them to know that they're Latino? Mm, turns out not a whole lot, right? So I need to understand more of their specific cultural background. Because it turns out Latino is not a homogenous background. Just like Caucasian is not a homogenous background. Just like all males are not the same, right? There's an enormous amount of variety. And so we have to understand those specific cultural forces that are impacting this family's parenting practices, things like, um, yes, racial and ethnic identity, but also religious identity, um, their level of acculturation, um, their level of accommodation, lots of different aspects that have to come into play there. To say, okay, well, not just what's their check marked box on the census, but what is their actual cultural background? And how is that playing out in the problems that someone is or isn't experiencing? So, what sort of questions do we ask, right? What sort of information do we need to know? Well, Things like level of acculturation, um, how that acculturation might be impacting symptom expression, um, how the family identifies, as well as how the child identifies. And are there mismatches there? Uh, for a lot of our families, you may have the child having a higher level of uh, acculturation to mainstream culture than you might have the parents, which can cause stressors. I see that all the time. Uh, I worked with uh, an Islamic uh, background family um, a couple of years ago who were having high amounts of parental conflict with their child because of very different levels of culture age and what the you know what the, the parents thought was appropriate versus what the teenage girl thought was appropriate and lots of conflict there. Um, and if I ignored sociocultural issues, then that would probably not have gone very well, right? Because uh, knowing why the parents are having you know, what they think is reasonable for this child versus you know, her thoughts on the matter uh, helps to inform intervention and understanding, uh, just like knowing kind of um, whether or not certain kinds of feelings or thoughts are uh, not talked about or seems taboo or something we just don't mention, um, whether or not those cultural forces may have uh, emphasized a particular symptom to be expressed and repressed others, um, whether or not they you know, have particular aspects of their cultural identity that influences how they view the world as a whole, you know, which we all do, it turns out. Um, Understanding those kinds of aspects allows you again, to get a richer, deeper formulation compared to just saying, oh, they're Latino, they're black, they're white. 
because it turned out there's an enormous amount of variability within every ethnic and racial identity. Uh, so avoiding things like stereotyping, in other words, uh, which is, is often very easy to do, especially if you're not a member of that particular racial or cultural identity. Then we talk about history and development, um, which really is very useful about knowing how a problem developed, um, as well as potentially knowing how are we going to tailor our treatment to this particular person based on their developmental level, based on their cognitive level, uh, based on their you know, the family as a whole. And this gives information too on the caregivers. Um, so if you know that, you know, the caregivers have been very involved in different kinds of intervention in the past for a child, as opposed to, yeah, we just, you know, we were court ordered to be here, um, even though we had all these problems. And that's going to give me a different understanding of you know how maybe willing they are to engage in the intervention process to be active participants in treatment. Um, so history and development very very important, but again you don't get super bogged down in those unnecessary details. Okay, like, well, how many baby teeth do they still have? It probably doesn't matter for most of us, right? Um, now it could be they have a specific. Um, medical condition that might be impacting something like that. Uh, my cousin, for example, uh, doesn't have adult teeth. So he's 42 years old. He still got his baby teeth. Uh, it, it, very bizarre. He just didn't have adult teeth. Uh, they just, so they didn't push the baby teeth out. Um, and he was you know, pretty um, very embarrassed by how his teeth looked uh, through part of his life. and. Uh, you know, that could have been impacted more health issues. So if I was assessing him, like that would be an important thing to know for him, but not for most people. So you have to try and, you know, separate out that, you know, again, what's the, the what's the wheat and what's the chaff, right? What's useful versus um, non-useful. So some common areas that we talk about with history and development, or health history, or treatment that you've engaged in, um, you know, whether or not you met developmental milestones in a reasonable fashion, what's school like, what are peer relationships like, what sort of relationships we have within the family, uh, what sort of disciplinary practices are used within the family, um, are there you know, problems with substance use or legal issues, because all that could shift in formulation and shift your intervention. Cognitive variables, which we'll talk quite a bit about throughout the semester, um, include products, structures, and processes. Um, and we'll talk more about these, but uh, these include things like, um, you know, your thoughts, kind of your automatic thoughts, which, you know, pop into your head, you can easily access those, as well as more things like schemata or belief systems that give rise to those automatic thoughts and potentially those distortions or misinterpretations of information around you that we can see from a process level. And we'll, you know, again, we'll talk quite a bit about those. And then we, of course, have our behavioral aspects that we have to take into account and think about. Um, where we talk about our antecedents, our behaviors, and our consequences in this classic ABC model, um, where you know, we're seeing what's being reinforced versus punished, um, what sort of discriminative stimuli are out there that are setting the stage for a behavior to occur here but not here, um, or what are antecedents that are kind of directly causing a behavior to occur. Um, so you know, lots and lots of aspects of behavior that you need to take into account, especially because, as you'll see, the majority of our interventions start at a behavioral level. Uh, so that becomes a very important thing. So when we start gathering this information, we start getting these different pieces of the wardrobe, 
um, we start being able to see how they relate to each other, how the history and development is related to uh, the cultural practices or familial practices, how those impact the behaviors that the family engages in in terms of reinforcement or punishment, uh, how those history and behavioral history uh, can impact the development of you know, their organizing beliefs and their schemata. And all of this starts to give you the story of your client, right? your ideographic psychological story, so that you understand, at least provisionally, what's going on with this person and how can we then start So, hey, that is probably where we will actually stop for today. Stop a little bit early. Um, so, thrown a lot at you on this very first day. What we'll pick up with next week is we'll actually we'll spend more time talking about formulation, and we'll start talking about how you put these things together. So, how do you really start telling that story from a evidence-based cognitive behavioral model with all these different pieces that are in play. And that'll really give you guys some time to do some more reading uh, and then be ready to kind of dive a bit deeper into this. All right. Questions, questions for now.